I would like to welcome you uh, to this talk uh, and our guest uh, uh, now is Paul Rosenberg. He's been speaking at this conference for every year, I guess, uh, since it started. Uh, oh, okay, since 2015. Um, he's an author of uh, uh, several books. Uh, uh, our very favorite one, which we read before we started this place, is uh, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men, uh, where he describes, uh, uh, among other things, uh, decentralized currencies and decentralized markets. Uh, that was before invention of Bitcoin, so it's a very visionary book and uh, um, it was very interesting read for us. Um, he also wrote uh, 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 other books like uh, uh, Breaking Down, which is one of the latest ones. I think you wrote a, a newer one about uh, time travel sort of thing. Um, he's also an author of uh, a newsletter, uh, which is now called Parallel Society. Uh, and uh, I'm a subscriber and a very happy reader. So when it arrives in my mailbox, uh, I'm really happy and it's usually the first thing that I read. Uh, so uh, now he will um, uh, talk about uh, what we are here for. The topic of this conference is opt out and it's also the topic of Paul's talk. So please welcome Paul Rosenberg. Better now? Ah, I can hear it too. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about opting out. We all have reasons to opt out, to try to get away um, from oppression, from problems, from things that are imposing upon us in our life. But one of the problems with it is we're opting out from, and we need to know or to develop what we're opting out to. It's to come, to run away from something is fine, it's necessary. To run to something is better. And this is what I think is the thing we need to do now. Um, we need to have a vision of where we're going to go. So we have some idea where we're going. And if you notice, we all do this. Once we decide upon something, we decide it might be the best thing to do, we tell stories to ourselves about how this works. What is the story about cryptocurrency? What are the things we tell ourselves, we replay in our mind about it? Humans always do this. We tell ourselves stories. And we need to have visions of where we're opting out to. Where are we going? What does it look like on the other side? So this is really important. Humans are what we tend to call teleological, really fancy word that the academics fight about. But what it means is, if I want to go have my glass of water, I don't think, okay, lift up this leg a little bit, lean this way, do this, turn, and go across here. I, you, we don't think of those things. I just say, I want my water, go. And we operate that way mentally as well as physically. And it's really, it's much, much better for us to have a vision of where we're going and then go for it. It's natural to us. It works well for us than to say, well, I've got to make step A and I've got to make step B and I've got to make step C. It's much more organic for us to see where we're going. And right now, for those of us who have opted out to whatever extent, we haven't developed our visions yet. At least not, not well enough, in my opinion. Um, we have certain things. We have... I like, you know, the gilded refugee. You know, Bitcoin goes to the moon and I'm going to fly around in a jet and stay in really nice hotels 
and I'm going to be awesome. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with flying around in a jet if you can do it. And there's, you know, hopefully Bitcoin goes to a gazillion dollars. Um, and does dollars become obsolete eventually? Um, but, you know, we have to have a vision of what kind of life we want. There's nothing wrong with this. It's probably not going to be terribly satisfying after the first couple of weeks. It'll be a fun couple of weeks, though, right? Um, but this is one of the models that we kind of have. It's just some of the stories we tell ourselves. Uh, another one is the tropical island, right? You'd be on the, on the beach, tapping on your laptop and making money, man. That's pretty sweet. And it is sweet. It's a nice thing to do. It doesn't age very well. Um, as people who have tried it will tell you, it's really cool that first week. But it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't really age very well. Um, it's fine, and there's nothing wrong with it. If this is what you really want to do, cool. Do it. Do it for 50 years if you want. Not a problem. Nothing wrong with it. But it's just one model. And we have this one. We have a little bit of the mysterious tycoon, you know. Uh, we've got that, too. You know, Bitcoin's going to go to the moon, and I'm going to set up a new whatever, and I'm going to be, you know, except... Do you really want to be a tycoon? Well, I don't know. Maybe some of us do, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's a fine choice. We have this. We have another one. We got the, you know, the exotic aunt or uncle, you know, traveling the world and doing an interesting. Here's a picture of Uncle Jim. He's at the pyramids this year. Okay. Um, which, again, there's nothing wrong with it. It's fine. If that's what turns you on, God bless. Go to the pyramids. You know, I have a, a subscriber to my newsletter who, you know, who did that for a few years and told me about it, you know, and he actually worked in the pyramid transcribing hieroglyphics. You know, it was really interesting. So it's nothing wrong with it. What we haven't built yet, or at least have, haven't built very thoroughly, is this. And this is what most humans really kind of want. You don't have to do it. There's no reason you have to do to live this way. But after a lot of years of observing humans, I can tell you that most people are happier in this type of setting and are more productive in this kind of setting than in others. Now, again, maybe that's not you. It's a significant percentage of us. But maybe it's not you. You don't have to do this. I'm not saying anybody needs to do it. But for most of us, it's, it's, it's a better, more productive setting. Everybody's family's a little crazy, right? We know this. Okay, that's fine. We're not talking about perfections here. <laughs> I just hurt him by saying that. Um, but everybody's family's a little nuts, so we're not perf expecting any perfection here. But for most people in most situations, this is really a more productive way of life for all of its problems. It provides a really nice base for most of us. And there's a lot, there's a lot of beauty to it. So I think this is something that we need to take seriously and to think about this model. Uh, w w when we're going outside, we want to build something outside that makes this possible. It's important. Um, yeah, but wait, tradition is bad, isn't it? And, you know, I totally understand torching tradition. I get it. I used to be that guy. I understand torching tradition. Tradition can be a weapon. It can be a bludgeon that hits you with, uh, that you get hit with, rather. So I understand that. But here's the thing. We should never take any tradition whole. But if you take the pieces out of it, there are always some good pieces inside of just about every tradition you can find. You think of traditional ideas, you go to like, well, don't kill, don't steal, um, take a special care for little kids and old people and pregnant ladies, and clean up the mess that you made, and those are all very traditional ideas. We don't want to give those up. So every tradition has some things in it that are useful because something is traditional is not a reason to toss it away. Examine it. Find the parts of it that are good. Take those parts, and the parts that aren't useful for you, leave them alone. 
maybe they're useful for that guy over there and not useful for you. Who knows? But this is, we need to look at them and not reject things because they're traditional and not accept things because they're traditional. Both are, most tradition has things that are valid. So it's important not to go too far on that. Now, this is really important. I'm going to spend a little time on this. There's been a divide and conquer game kind of played upon us. And I speak us, I mean those of us um, of the Western civilization over the last few centuries. And that is not dividing us by the basis of, you know, the people who speak our language here and those evil people who speak a different language on the other side of the hill. Um, but dividing us by generations, by time. We've lost connection with our ancestors. Uh, for whatever troubles they had, whatever difficulties they had, our ancestors were not idiots. I use this picture because what they built was a Christian capitalist civilization. Now, that's very complicated. You have four hours of history to explain properly exactly what I mean by Christian and capitalist. I do not mean... Um, the gigantic church out of Rome, and I do not mean state capitalism. I mean Christianity proper and capitalism proper, free market economics. These people built it, and in the last few centuries, all of their flaws have been amplified and made much bigger than they were, and their virtues have been wiped off, wiped out of history. What I want you to understand is that the European civilization that was had some very important, very humane, benevolent aspects to it. European, in Europe, let's take the worst, the worst examples of being the, the church when it was the church and a lot of crazy ideas were coming out of Rome. Sure, bad stuff, a lot of bad stuff. But almost every town in Europe had a priest, a nun, a, a monk, a somebody who was a good and caring human being, who looked out for the poor, who watched out for the, for the kid who was going over the edge, who took care of the young parents who were struggling with their children, who watched out for them. Europeans saw goodness in the world. They knew it existed. They expected it to exist. This was important. And if they had errors, which... Duh, they did, because we still do. If they had errors, the job was not to toss them away, but to repair the errors. They were in a deeper darkness than we, than we are. We find ourselves in a better position than where they were, but somehow they struggled forward, and guess what? It was they who brought us to where we are now. So it's really very important to, to not get so, so separated from our ancestors, they, they, came, they brought us a long way and they deserve credit for it. And I want to tell you something that's even bigger than what this is that the European civilization that formed in the wake of Rome, as Rome didn't really fall the way people say, it kind of, you know, dissolved. Um, as Rome dissolved, they left behind 20 or 30 million slaves. Europe was covered with slavery. It was the economic system of the Roman Empire and pretty much every, everything else in the old days. <sighs> Within a few centuries, the European civilization of 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 1000 AD killed slavery. It is the first time in recorded history that slavery was destroyed on a civilizational scale. Never happened before. These people did it. They get credit for doing that. Did they do it perfectly and pristinely? No, they didn't, but they did it. And then when it sprang up on the North American continent some centuries later, as soon as, as, soon as enough European Christians got to the New World, they killed slavery there too. That's how it actually happened. See, there's this huge gap. Slavery is gone from Europe at 1000 AD, but all of a sudden it pops back up in North America. Well, it's because there weren't any Europeans there at the time. The slavers got there. The slavers and their backers got there and started abusing the people there. 
But as soon as enough European Christians got there, it was wiped out. Now, this is not to say that Christianity is, is a perfect thing or that Europeans are ideal human beings. You know, our guys are idiots just like everybody else's guys have, have some idiots, and we make mistakes and do stupid things too. But they did this, and it was the first time it ever happened, and they did it twice. And one of the great errors of history that I will fix if, to whatever extent I'm able to do it is these people get credit for this. And they did it by creating an economic system that replaced slavery. See, slavery was about, it was a means of gathering surplus. So if you needed money to, buy, to build a new granary, if you needed money to build a new well, if you needed whatever, you got your surplus from your slaves. It's a really good way of getting surplus. You get a lot of surplus real fast. You know, you have to enslave other human beings in the process, so I don't recommend it but it really worked. And these people got rid of it for moral reasons, and then they had to develop some other way of gaining surplus, right? Because you got to build a barn sometimes, and you have to dig a ditch, and you have to you know, build your irrigation system. So they learned how to create surplus by being clever, by finding new ways of doing things, of, added, of adapting, of finding new ways to make things so you can get a little of a profit margin in there, which is your surplus. And it's hard. It's harder than slavery. It's easier with slavery to generate a surplus than it is with capitalism in most places, in most cases, I should say. So, but these people didn't do it because they wouldn't do it, and they created a system that brought us to where we are. So, uh, to me, this is, uh, if, you know, if you're, well, I was going to say if you remember nothing else, but there's one other thing you have to remember. <laughs> we'll get there. Now, the parallel model that we want to build on the outside that's a, that encompasses a much wider group of people than just the gilded refugee and so on is really the model of the synagogue when you think about it. Uh, I don't mean necessarily religiously, but the synagogue began in roughly 500 B.C. It's a complex story. The entire, or not the entire, but m most of the nation of Judea was taken away to Babylon, and for the first time they had to separate their religion, their ideology, from their geography. And this was a new thing. It hadn't really been done before. I mean, there must be some little case that I'm missing, but it really hadn't been done. So they had to separate what they believed with where they lived, and they created a portable culture. And again, it's all complicated, and it didn't take its final form to like 140 or 200 AD, whatever. They created this parallel culture. I want you to understand something. During this period of time, the Greeks came and went. The Romans came and went. The Persians, the Sinacids, the you name them, uh, Charlemagne and everything else, all came, all gone. The parallel culture remains through some really harsh circumstances. And it remains. This is a really interesting model for us. If we want to build something outside, something parallel, something different, I think there are things to learn here. Because this thing has survived and has done reasonably well all these years. Let me give you some basics of how this portable civilization worked. And, you know, these are the old, the old Jewish traditions. Uh, but again, it's 2,000 years and, and they're still here, so there might be something to learn here. Anytime there was a community where there were 10 adult males within commuting distance, so they could know each other, they had to form a community. This was expected of them. If there's, how many, oh, you're living over there. How many people are there over there? How many Jews are there over there? Oh, we got so-and-so. Oh, you got 12. Well, you can form a community now. And if you didn't, you had to have kind of a reason why not. And this was expected. So you had to form a community. As soon as 120 were living in the same area, you had to build a school or open a school or something. You had to have your own school. And you had to also have a court for moderating disputes between each other. You had to have some way of doing it because this was necessary for it to keep this culture going. You also had to create a school. And not only create a school, but you had to provide free school if there are orphans or if there are poor people who can't afford it. They go anyway. You who can afford to, 
to, to keep this to pay your dues or however you arrange it. You have to do it. You must take care of the, your own poor. That was, that was part of the deal. Um, they had to support themselves and you had to watch out for each other because you were alone. You weren't part of the mainline culture. You may, whether or not you were persecuted, sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't, you had to take care of yourself. So in the early days, one of the big risks was being enslaved. You know, you're out on your boat trading with the next town over and some, some pirates come through and, you know, all of a sudden your uncle is enslaved somewhere. Well, the job of the community where he's from was to put together your money and buy him back out of slavery. You got seven years, get the guy out of slavery. If not, why not? Why didn't you do it? It was necessary. So these are the type of things that en enabled this to survive all these other empires and to continue for whatever problems they had. You know, there's stupid guys of every flavor and difficult human difficulties all the time everywhere. But it worked, and it still exists. Um, and Christianity in the beginning was the same way. You can remember Christianity that, that we know was founded by essentially a rabbi, Saul of Tarsus, whom most people know as St. Paul. He was a Pharisee, and these guys are the ones that became the rabbis. So it was built along a Jewish model, and the ecclesiastes, the church that Paul taught people to set up, was essentially a synagogue. It has little variances and little differences, but it was essentially the synagogue model, and this is the Roman Emperor Julian who hated Christians. I mean, this guy really did not like me. Called them atheists. And a lot of Romans did at the time. They were atheists because they didn't worship the gods, right? They had this other thing that they did. So they called them atheists. Anyhow, he says, it is a scandal that there's not a single Jew who's a beggar. And that these godless Galileans, those are the Christians, these godless Galileans don't only care not only for their own, but they take care of our guys as well. So they're not only doing like the Jews, they're even going further. Okay, so it, it, Christianity was the same model, and just for fun, up until, well, at least 400 and 400 and some AD, Christians attended synagogue. Not all of them, but a lot of them did, and we know this because a very, very famous preacher of, of the time named John Chrysostom we still have, we have copies of these sermons that he preached telling all the Christians they should not, they should stop going to synagogues because they're not the same and you can't go there, you have to go here. We know, I mean, there's four, five, six sermons we have from this guy. And he was a big guy. He was the um, Archbishop of Constantinople or Bishop of Constantinople. Major, major position in those days. So... The Christian Christianity was the same at the beginning, anyway. So here's our question. You know, right now we're already setting up new communities, aren't we? All right. I don't know if 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 parallel polis has been used to settle disputes, but I'll bet that it has on to some level. Now there are a lot of young people in the audience here, and. You know, one of the characteristics of young people all through the years is if you leave them alone, they kind of tend to pair off, and pretty soon they're having kids. So all of a sudden, if we've got a bunch of kids around here, do we need to start our own school? Yeah. You know, maybe we do. So then pretty soon, plus, you know, the Jews had their particular ideology. We've got an ideology too. We've got some pretty strong feelings about our ideas as well. So at what point are we doing the same thing? You know, I, we can argue about definitions, but you know, at some point we're doing the same thing, and it's a good model. Forget about the religious aspect. It's a good model of organization, and it's something at least I think we should keep in mind and learn from because these guys have had 2,000 years to work through a lot of, a lot of the mistakes. We don't want to repeat all that. <laughs> all right? So here we are, I love this picture, but here we are, we're on the outside, you know, what do we build? Well, there's all sorts of ideas. I'm going to give you a, a few of my own kind of overall sorts of ideas, just something to keep, to keep in the tank and, and think about. 
first, we want to build systems that are geared for our abilities, not for our fears. If you look at the national systems that surround you, and especially with all of the uh, you know, 24-7 um, what I, uh, news systems, I call them fear delivery systems, um, of all these things, a huge portion of modern life is built around what we're afraid of or what many people are afraid of. I don't want to build on things I'm afraid of. Yeah, okay, if there's some danger, okay, you know, some maniac comes down your, your street, you know, burning houses, then you got to do something. Okay, yeah, it sucks. But how often does that really happen to us? Not much. I don't want to build based on our fears. I want to build something that's geared for our abilities, that give us a chance to, to use what we have in us not something that's just, oh, we're afraid this could happen, and this could happen, and this might happen, and this could happen. Well, you can do that forever. Imaginary fears are infinite. If you took this group and said, okay, everyone, here's a, here's, here's a pencil and a piece of paper. Let's start writing down things we might possibly be afraid of. We'd be here for weeks because you can just do that. Okay, so imaginary fears are infinite. I don't want to build based upon fear. Fear makes humans stupid. We don't want to do that. I want to build with things that are geared for our abilities. <sighs> I want to put the human consciousness above rules. This is, a, this is a concept that takes a little getting used to. I write about it in the newsletter. I think it's a really important point. Rules are binary displacements of analysis in consciousness. Yes, no, on, off, in, out. Um, this is the rule. It's the law, sir. Can't think about it. It's what it is. So there are a real problem with rules. Um, it's a long involved subject, uh, but I would ask you really to, to, to keep it in mind because rules by themselves are not really our friend. We've always been taught to think of it that way. And look, we, we've been raised with a mechanized um, a mechanical view of the universe. You know, Isaac Newton, the orbits of the planet, Kepler, and all this stuff. We can do it with math. We know how everything works. That mechanized view is really good for science. It's really good for you know, tech and whatever else, but it's not particularly good for us. So I want to put consciousness above rules. And again, it's a long subject, but keep it in mind. If, if you're interested, there's stuff in my newsletter about it. I want to get rid of status. Again, this is a concept that people have a hard time with sometimes because we've all grown up with status. But status, by its very nature, is divisive and conflict-generating. Status, depending on whose definition you use, is a recognition of my standing versus your standing. That's what it is. That's its definition. My standing versus your standing. Oh, who's better? Who's higher in the status ranking, me or you? This can cause nothing but conflict and division between people. It's a bad concept. First of all, it's just ridiculous because we are very complicated beings. You, you may have more money than me. I may be more healthy than you. You may be better at languages. I may be better at math. We're different in a thousand ways from each other. And to just put one tag, status, high, low, is stupid. And it harms us. So, again, this is just one of these ideas to keep in the back of your head. Uh, it takes time to get used to, but I really think it's important. This is a big deal. This is the other thing that if you, know, if you remember nothing else, remember, remember this. Um, we have to accept that good things can grow within us. This is a quote, quote from Carl Jung, and he says, people will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to, to fa avoid facing their souls. They'll do all manner of rigorous and mystical things because they have not the slightest faith that anything good can come out of their own soul. Again, the model for us, for science, mechanical model is, of looking at things is fine. It's appropriate. For us, the model is organic, seeds, growth, um, bearing fruit, so on. Those are the models for us. 
They work much better for us. And the truth is that the great and the good can grow in us. We've been taught so often to think that, oh, you know, we have to be careful. We're right on the edge of breaking the law or breaking a commandment. And then if we do something wrong, oh, it cancels everything else we already did. No, it's a wrong model. It's bad for us. And good things can grow out of us. Um, the great opportunity that stands before us with going out, opting out, being outside, is we can build places where we can function that way. The great, the great passage on this was from Abraham Maslow, a very famous uh, and justly noted um, psychologist. He, and he said, uh, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but I don't, but it's very close to, children have peak experiences all the time. But, one, but the school systems of the present world are uniquely designed to stop it and to keep them from having peak experiences and to prevent peak experiences. So the systems of the world of the national state systems are designed against the better functions of human nature, and they have to be, you understand. If people were not intimidated, if people were not afraid, if people were not confused, they, don't, they wouldn't obey very well. If you want humans to obey without thinking, they have to be a little bit afraid. They have to be kind of intimidated. They have to be kind of confused and not trust their own minds, not learn how to trust their own minds. Otherwise, they, they don't, if they do, they don't obey very well. And if you're running a system that requires obedience, you need people to be that way. So we haven't believed this, but we do need to believe this, that great things can grow, can grow out of us. And it's true. So what we need are transcendent goals. Uh, making money is fine. Making money is necessary. Um, all these things matter. But we need something to really operate well. We need something that's magnificent, something that's majestic, something that's wonderful to work for. If it's just money, okay, you know, especially when you don't have any, that matters a lot. But you want to, to really build something great, you have to have a majestic goal. You have to have something that's awe-inspiring. Here's, I'll give you a few. We're running a little low on time, so I'll give you a few. Eliminating scarcity. We now know, we have the information in our libraries, on the internet, we have all the information we, had, we need, and it's been tried and tested a hundred times, to feed every person on the planet well. We have enough information to build cars and houses and roads and whatever else we need for every person on the planet, probably times two. We know how to do this. We don't grow a lot of food because there's no one to, to buy it. There's no one to eat it. In, uh, the United, in North America in particular, there's a huge gap between what could be grown and what is grown, even grown properly with crop rotation and everything. We know how to do this. There's no reason anybody should, should be deprived of any basic needs on this planet anymore, and it's been the case for 30 years, maybe 40 years. It's absolutely been the case. We haven't done it because there are bottlenecks. But this, you want a, tr a transcendent goal? This is something. Human starvation, human deprivation, lack of basic things. We can kill it forever. I mean, unless an asteroid strikes. Uh, but, you know. <laughs> um, this is a goal. And we know exactly how to do it, without question. Expanding through the universe. This is something I want to do. This is a big goal. And remember, we put 12 men on the moon with 50 and 60-year-old technology. The first trip to the moon was 1968. The first landing was 69, but the first trip there was 1968. That's a lot of years ago now. You think computers and manufacturing technologies and the chemistry for the fuels and everything else, it's a whole lot better now than it was then, and it's, not that, it's, it's just not that hard. F discovering something, figuring it out the first time, that's hard. But after it's been figured out, teaching it to the next group of people, that's not so bad. Um, a lot of the 
formerly third world nations, are getting in on this. Do you know that India, the nation of India, has a satellite in orbit of Mars? Look it up. They do. It's not that hard anymore. Um, this is standing in front of us. It's not that hard. Yes, it's difficult, and yes, there will be some loss of life along the way. It, you know, new adventures are, are tough that way. Well, okay. But this is doable for us. It's not that, it, it, again, they went with technology from the 1960s to the moon and back, safely, several times. I've met one or two of the guys who did it. It can be done. This stands before us. Here's another one. Okay. We don't have any more image of the great soul, of the wonderful man and woman who has a rich internal life. And, you know, the wise person you can talk to who understands things and can explain things to you. And this doesn't much exist anymore, but it should. And I think some of us really need to uh, to work on this, I think it's an important thing. It's a, it's, it's a tremendous thing to do. Um, I have some, like, really quick, easy way to, to start doing it. Um, I, I won't go through all of it because we're, we're running low on time. But, you know, take your peak experiences. Take the best moments of your life when you did your best, when you were really working well. Think about them. Take time to examine them. Turn them over in your mind. Think about how it worked, what it worked, what it felt like, and keep working with these things. Oh, pretty soon you're going to start getting more of them. Pretty soon you're going to start becoming a better person. And over time, you become the human with a great soul. Um, final slide, and this is where I really want to get a couple things said. We have it in our power us here right now to begin the world over again. This quote comes from the American Revolution, which was complicated and people describe it for their own purposes a lot of different ways. But this was an empty continent where a bunch of people with mostly good ideas decided that they didn't want to live the old way anymore. And of course it was very complicated and I'm, and I'm not giving it, doing it justice. But they decided, this quote is from Thomas Paine in 1776, which is right at the height of the American Revolution as I look at it. And he said, oh my God, here we are. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. And this is the position we have found ourselves in since cryptography really sprang on the world. Uh, and, it, and it gave us a way to wall off territory. And it's mathematics. And try to win a fight with mathematics. Good luck. Cryptography is just math. You can't put a bullet in it. Um, so we have cryptography. We have amazing technology. We have all sorts of things going for us. And we have the ability to start the world over again. And as I see it, Opting out, yes, we opt out from, and it's, it's a necessity, I understand. But we also have to think about what we're opting out to. And the opportunity that we really have now is to build outside something, a new environment. Humans create their own environments. They're, we're unique that way. We create our own environments. Um, we have this opportunity on the outside to build an environment where the human things, the great and good things within us, have a chance to thrive, have a chance to expand, where they're not being held down by impositions and demands and intimidations and fears, and we have a chance to really become what humans are supposed to be. This we can do, and this, to me, is the opportunity that stands in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for questions, so uh, please wait for the microphone. And I'll start with the first one. Um, um, a lot of people, psychologists, say that uh, 
a lot of what we do unconsciously in human interactions is uh, status signaling. And you've been um, uh, saying that we should somehow abandon status. So my question is, first of all, if it's achievable and if it's the same thing you're talking about. So building hierarchies or just uh, 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 in relation to just unconscious status signaling and kind of the uh, instinctive uh, way of showing status signaling status. Uh, yes, both are possible. Both are very clearly possible. Um, rather than giving personal examples, let me tell you a story about status. We obviously are more capable and better, if you will, than primates, than mere primates. We're primates also, but there was a, a researcher who followed a troop of baboons for 10, 20 years, and they had all of the status things. These, the larger males or the senior males would slap around all the young guys and everybody would slap around the females. And um, it was just, you know, your nightmare status situation. But this is how baboons operate. That's how a whole lot of uh, things in the animal kingdom operate. And so, you know, this is just textbook ordering of basic primate civilization until one day there was um, near where these baboons lived, they were putting in a new hotel. And somebody threw away some bad meat because they looked at it and you know, this isn't good, throw it away, we can't feed this to our guests. Well, the baboons found it and it was actually tainted at that point, I don't know how this happened, but it was tainted with tuberculosis. And the baboons found it and all of the males, the big males, the older males, <laughs> They slap the young guys away, say, you know, get out of here. They slap the females away, and they ate the meat. They all died. So in a matter of a number of days, we had a baboon troop with all of the dominance taken away. Guess what? They were never dominant again. The males stopped beating up the younger males. They stopped, they stopped slapping around the females. They started grooming each other more, which was, you know, what baboons do. And they started taking, and the, all of the chemicals, which are the same as the chemicals we have for stress and high blood pressure and all of that goes along with it, went down. And it maintained that for at least 10 years that I know of. So if baboons can do this, we can do this too. The problem is we've been trained so long in these ideas. We look at the world that way. Growing up in the factory era, you know, what's the difference between the important person and the unimportant person? The important person orders other people around, right? That makes you an important person. You order other people around. And if you take orders, well, you're just a worker. And so we're so used to this model, but if baboons can get over it, I'm really confident that we can too. Okay, we have time for one more question. Thanks again for the great talk, Paul. I'm always so, um, you know, lightened up whenever you talk. Oh, thank um, you. So uh, great that you made it again this year. And um, my question is, you said that um, before, um, in a personal talk, you said decades. You, you look at decades <laughs> if you think about personal development. And in your talk, you said, also, you know, a five-year plan maybe is uh, too short-sighted. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you, when you think about business, all, they always ask you, like, what's your five-year plan, right? But, you know, five years is really too short-sighted. You said with the synagogue, you know, look at the sh centuries. <laughs> that's obviously, that's too much for a human lifetime to see what works and what doesn't. Um, but, um, yeah, um, the question is, you know, you, you made fun of the... Um, of the technology from the moon from the 60s. But if you look at it in centuries, <laughs> that's, that's really nothing, right? Right, right. So um, the, the question is, um, wh what, what is the possibility? You know, wh wh what can we 
can we you said look at look at what your peak experiences were what's the peak experience of humankind then can we can we look at this in centuries as oh, well okay <laughs> yeah we can look at it in centuries and you know right now we look back two three hundred years and we say gee they were bleeding people if you had an ailment you would you know drip drip blood and a lot of people did it, uh, you know, it, it was stupid, it made no sense, but it was what everybody did, so everybody else did it. 200 years from now, what are they going to say about us for certain things? Um, which they will. We are moving forward. There's no question, but human, humanity is far less tolerant of cruelty than it used to be. Even in my lifetime. Humanity is far less tolerant of cruelty. We demand more creativity and the ability to be creative than we used to. Now, the people in this room are probably outlier, outliers that way, but, but humanity in general feels that way. We are very definitely becoming better. Fast enough? Well, <laughs> you know, we'd all like it to be faster. Um, but there's no question humanity is getting better and we are going to uh, find amazing things in the future. Again, once we get into space, everything, or not everything, but a whole lot of things change. Uh, I, there, that's a whole talk of its own, of all the things that change when humans get, in, including our bodies, by the way, um, when we get out in space. Uh, is space going to be a panacea? No, it won't. It's going to be problematic, and we're going to bring problems with it because we're not fully developed yet either, and we carry problems in ourselves. That's the wonderful thing. I know I'm getting a little off topic, but that's the wonderful thing about having transcendent goals because if you're going after something awesome, something awe-inspiring, something wonderful, then it helps you get past all the little BS problems in our daily lives. You know, oh, he's doing this and should have done that. Or she said this and he said that. All those little stupid things that people get drawn into, if you're focused on this long, immense, wonderful goal, you tend to ignore those things and you produce better. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hi. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I made a lot of notes, actually. and um, what? So, I've actually always thought of consciousness as one of the steps to sovereignty and individualism. I think you can agree with that. Yes. And um, as you said, there should be a proper setting of shared context, shared values, the system of belief, if we actually want to build a society of conscious people. Um, did I understand correctly that you used Christianity, Judaism as an um, example of a principle that we can use in order to build something out there to opt out to? I think we can take from their, from first of all, from their history uh, to see how they arranged themselves and how they worked. Um, Christianity makes a beautiful example. Early Christianity, I'm talking about, the first few centuries. Because these people were inside of a very hostile situation with the Roman Empire. And they just kept doing what they were doing. They were outsiders, but they didn't fight Rome. They just were living their own different way and separating from it. And over several centuries, the people who lived with them saw that these are decent people. They're not crazy. They believe things we don't believe, but they're not terrible. And over time, Rome went away, and these people remained. And they built um, the European civilization. The important thing about Judaism and Christianity are the core values. The applications have stunk. Uh, you know, if you, if you can take Jesus and take him out of everything else, just take his words and take them out. I, I, I mean, I wrote a book about this earlier this year. <laughs> um, it's a really good set of ideals. I don't agree with how they've been implemented in many cases. But the ideals themselves, the, the Jewish concepts, the he old Hebrew concepts of justice above ruler, uh, of we can improve. We are able. What we do matters. All of these sorts of principles are essential. Well, actually, that was my question. Uh, slightly different, though. Okay. Um, so you are offering to use the system of belief, which cornerstone is to actually give up just sovereignty to external God, 
and to totally surrender to his judgment as an example of the basic layer of society of conscious individuals? No. You are, in, you are inserting all sorts of interpretations into this set of ideas that I don't. And I don't, I don't agree okay. with those insertions. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for uh, coming Thank here. You. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, before you leave, I just want to let you know that uh, if you want to see the next uh, talk of Professor Robin Hansen, it's also streamed to the Slevarna, to the other room, so you can uh, pick a comfortable seat if you are sitting on the floor, and we'll be back shortly. <laughs>